up 5 percent. The different branches of the military held briefings on their parts of the president's budget plan. We're going to watch two of them now, first the Army, then the Navy. Um, I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, Under Secretary of the, the Army Ryan McCarthy is going to provide opening comments, followed by Lieutenant General Thomas Horlander, the military deputy to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Financial Management and Comptroller. He will provide an overview of the Army's portion of the President's fiscal year 2020 budget request. Following their remarks, well, we should have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I'll call on you and I'd like to keep it to one question just because I want to make sure we get as many questions as possible. Okay, with that, Under Secretary. Thank you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the key shifts undertaken in this fiscal year 20 effort. But uh, when we ask you to kind of look at this, look at it in the context of what we've done in 18 and 19 and how it fits together as we kind of march across the FIDIP uh, from the choices that were made in fiscal year 18 and 19. Uh, as, as we published the National Defense Strategy in January of 2018, there were four key pillars associated with the NDS, nuclear posture, great power competition, irregular warfare, and partnership capacity. Now, the great power competition is a central challenge associated with this NDS and something where the Army in particular had to make some pretty uh, significant uh, steps as we, as we try to modernize our force but maintain a readiness posture that where, quite frankly, we fill over 60 percent of requirements worldwide for combatant commanders. So in this, in this budget, you'll see that readiness is our number one priority and will remain that way till at least fiscal year 22, when we can get all of our brigade combat teams, about two-thirds of our brigade combat teams, to the highest level of readiness. So we're maxing out our CTC rotations, home station training, and trying to fill brigade combat teams with 105 percent manning. So uh, readiness is, will continue to be the number one uh, priority for the Army. Uh, the, the choices in this budget for modernization that were truly difficult and, and, uh, but challenging, but ones that the entire Army leadership uh, stood shoulder to shoulder on and owned. Uh, the choices that were initially made in fiscal year 18 and 19 was where we restructured the S&T budgets and moved 80 percent of those dollars against six modernization priorities. Long-range precision fires, next-generation combat vehicles, future vertical lift, network, integrated air missile defense, and soldier lethality, spanning all fundamentals. We had two complementary efforts of synthetic training environment and position navigation and timing. So we, and within those six kind of plus two priorities, there are 30 signature systems that will require substantial funding in the out years so that we can pull them through that uh, weapons modernization knothole. These, these decisions that were made we're essentially priming the pump in 18 and 19. So that budget deal in 18 and 19 not only helped us restore our readiness posture, but really to prime the pump for our modernization efforts across the future. In fiscal year 20, which is where we make this almost symbolic or signature step to depart from legacy systems of our big five uh, weapon systems that are standing in our formations today. Clearly, this will take time spanning across a fit-up and even longer to bring these new systems online and field them into our formations. So last spring and summer, the Army leadership conducted what you've all heard of as night court. The uh, Army staff has a sense of humor. So uh, we spent the spring and summer together, sp spanning north of 70 hours, principles only. Everybody had to do their homework and to lay in these hard choices against our priorities. In the process, We've truncated the buys over 93 systems and terminated 93 others. Found north of $30 billion across the entire budget of the fiscal, the five-year futures defense plan and laying in those cuts over time to finance our ambition. In 18 and 19, when we started this process, we were at about 80% legacy investments to 20 modernization. With the shift of that S&T budget, we went to about 70-30. The choice between 20 to 24, we will get to 50-50 investing against developmental systems and legacy by the end of this FIDIP. Uh, these choices were complex and they were difficult. And at times people will focus in on 
the you know the the folks that had you know winners and losers if you will but what we look at is the choices we had to make from a modernization standpoint to be the army we need by 2028 this presents enormous opportunity in business for the for uh, for commercial entities that do business with us north of 57 billion dollars in the out years so if we're looking for companies in, around the country, we'll work with them, but we also want them to invest and come along with us because we have to make these choices for the future. Um, we'll try to limit my time so we can get General Horlander to walk you through some charts and be happy to take your questions. General Horlander. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Great to see everyone. Um, so I will probably uh, spend just a little bit of time on the first couple of charts. I think uh, we, they've been covered by the secretary and then previously by DOD. Uh, but you can see uh, the, the real point I'd like to make here on this first chart is of a, of a million man army at any, any given day, we have 180,000 soldiers still across 140 countries. Okay, that's a sizable footprint. There's a lot of activity. And I will tell you the activity is only increasing uh, as, time, as time goes on. You're familiar with the strategic environment. You know, you're familiar with the NDS, the, the, the threats that are out there. I don't need to cover that in any great detail. And I will tell you, so the, strate the strategic approach that the secretary already covered, I think pr pr pretty much speaks for itself. You guys know the Army budget is really broken up into three components, in strength, readiness, and modernization. We're on a trajectory to have modest growth in our in strength. We are on a trajectory, as you heard the secretary say, to build readiness to two-thirds of our BCTs to the highest state of readiness by 2022. And we have a modernization strategy that fully, or that supports the, uh, the NDS to get us at, at, at an end state of 2028. In addition to that, there are a lot of efforts to strengthen the partnerships with our allies. And I'll also tell you there has been a lot of effort put into the business reforms across the Department of the Army. So, um, I took some time, and I won't go uh, in detail on this, but if you look at this chart, this is really a simple way to look at what we've done over time in terms of an in ways and means framework, okay? And so I would just kind of pick up with, uh, uh, you're already familiar with the ends that were provided to us by the, uh, the uh, OSD uh, and Army senior leaders, and have pretty much covered what is there in the ways. But the means, the goodness here is, uh, as you can see, we, we have enjoyed an increase in the defense top line here for the United States Army and, of course, the entire department for the last couple of years. And because, because of that, we've been able to uh, have a more balanced program, okay? And um, so the, the point to really be made here, we're not, when we, when we developed this budget, when we sat there and did night course and all this, one of the going in th things that all of the Army senior leaders want to do is not go back to the department, not go back to Congress, and ask for more money to modernize to get us to the 2028 modernization strategy. So as, as you look at the numbers there, you can see we are asking for uh, from this current year, FY19, to 2020, it's only about a two and a half uh, increase to our budget. The total request totals $182.3 billion. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the 9.2. 182.3 represents the Army's requirements in 2020 budget request, okay? And you can see how that breaks out between base and OCO. Now, when I talk to you, I talk apples to apples. What are my base requirements? $150.7 billion. What are my OCO for OCO requirements? Uh, 25.8, and I think most of you are familiar with, we have a couple of pass-through accounts for uh, the Army Security Force Fund and the Counterterrorism uh, Equipping Fund. But that represents the totality of $182.3 billion. Uh, in building this budget, we uh, employed several themes. Familiar with some of those? The other things I'd like to just cover on this slide for you really quick are, um, while we uh, are going to increase capacity, build readiness, and pursue a pretty aggressive modernization program, uh, we, also, we also are investing in our, our critical infrastructure. That's both Army family housing and just buildings uh, across, across the, the footprint there. Uh, clearly, uh, we took a lot of time and dedicated some resources to supporting the Army's uh, families. And, and our civilians. And then, of course, I can talk to you more about the streamlining uh, and the reforms that we implemented here uh, in, that, that enable us really to optimize the purchasing power of the budget that we are requesting. Here's, here is um, 
Here it is broken out by OCO and base. You can see very clearly that in my base request, or in the Army's base request, sorry, of 150.7, there is a portion of that that is OCO for base. Um, but the totality of the base request for us is 150.7. Uh, most of those show a, a, an increase uh, from, from what we got enacted in FY19. And uh, with, uh, as is consistent across the entire department, a pretty sizable increase in our rdt and &E accounts. And we can talk more about that here as we go. Uh, in OCO, we're funding pretty much the same operations that we funded here in FY19. Um, with Freedom Sentinel, of course, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, the ones that you're very familiar with to include the funding for EDI over there in Europe. So uh, in our personnel accounts, um, obviously the, this is the biggest slice of, our, of, of the Army's budget. We are requesting uh, over $60 billion, not inconsistent with what we've asked for in years past. Uh, this is to... Um, this is to continue on a trajectory of growth, however, a more modest trajectory than what you were familiar with in the past. That's across all three compos. Uh, this also includes uh, an increase in our soldiers' pay, both uh, for the pay, the basic housing allowance, and the subsistence allowance as well. And of course, this will allow us to recruit and retain the soldiers we need to to achieve our desired end state. That, um, that desired end state here in the active component is 480,000 uh, soldiers here in, in FY20. And then you can see up there on the slide, uh, same for the uh, Guard and the Reserve, the, the trajectory for the Guards, an additional 500 soldiers, and for the Army Reserves, 250. I take you to uh, op our operations and maintenance account. Uh, total request is 52.6. Again, that is for all three components of the United States Army. And uh, this will allow us to stay on our trajectory to attain or to achieve our readiness goals by 2022. Uh, I would mention, uh, because of the consistent funding that we've gotten at a higher level here over the last couple of years has really allowed us to make some great readiness gains. Uh, greater than 55% of our BCTs right now are at a higher level of readiness than what they were in previous years. So there's some good news there. Uh, and um, we will need to continue this level of funding to achieve those readiness goals that we've set for ourselves by 2022. Um, we've, also, uh, we've also funded 32 C CTC rotations. 25 of those are decisive action rotations. That's consistent with last year. And four of those are for the Army National Guard. You might remember several years ago, uh, the Army National Guard did not have BCT CTC rotation. So we feel really good about uh, having uh, our Combo 2 units go and do that. We're also building readiness in our uh, combat aviation brigades. As you can see uh, on the slide there, there's an increase in the amount of money we are spending uh, for um, uh, uh, hours per flight crew per, per month. And so uh, both in the, in the uh, active component and in the National Guard, we've extended our one station unit training for those initial entry soldiers to 22 uh, weeks for the infantry. We're going to do the same for some of our other combat arms branches. So th this budget gets after that as well. Um, so funding for some of our um, multilateral exercises, both in the Pacific and in Europe, uh, that'll help us to build the, 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 those critical partnerships that we need with our allies. Uh, we are we are right now uh, funding. Our installation services, we call that base operation support at 85% of the requirement. That's an increase. That's a good news story. And then to maintain our facilities, um, I, 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 let me correct myself. For installation uh, services is 94%. I, I misspoke. For our facilities, and when I talk about maintaining facilities in the O&M account, I'm talking about soldiers' barracks, and I'm talking about all of the existing facilities that we have out there uh, on the Army installations. Right now, we're funding our sustainment at 85% of the requirement, and in this budget, we are asking for an additional $600 million for the restoration and modernization of many of those facilities. So um, that, is, that is pretty much uh, what we're asking for here in the, in, in the O&M budget. So let me transition very quickly to uh, the, the, the third big slice, if you will, of the Army's budget, and that is our research development and acquisition i.e. modernization. Um, this, this, this entire modernization effort totals $34 billion uh, in, in, this, in this request. It's a bold shift, as you heard the Secretary describe that over time. 
it does it isn't all going to happen in fy20 so it's a uh, incrementally done over the next five years and then beyond that as well uh, but right now we're looking at uh, uh, quite an uptick in rdt and e and you can see there's about a 1.1 uh, billion dollar increase in our rdt and e efforts and then uh, just a small uh, a small decrease in in the procurement we can talk more about that here in just a minute so this this allows us to stay on that end state to modernize by 2028 in accordance with the army strategy and our modernization strategy uh, and as you heard the army senior army senior leaders architected uh, a, a plan to do this uh, through the processes of night court and deep dives and what have you um, and so when I talked to you about reforms though part of the biggest reforms that we had was the establishment of the Army Futures Command the establishment of the eight cross-functional teams that many of you are familiar with, and of course how we align those 30 modernization signature systems underneath those eight CFTs. That is a huge reform. We, we see that as tantamount to being able to modernize by 2028. Um, there are a number of other things that, that are components of this modernization strategy that, that played out as we built this budget, so clearly a divestiture of some of our legacy systems over time. Uh, that doesn't mean we're just totally divorcing ourselves from our, or our, our legacy systems. We're still going to need those, especially as we transition to the next generation capabilities that, that we endeavor to build. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> and then, a as you can see, uh, over time, th as, as the secretary described, we're going to be eliminating or reducing or delaying some of, some of the some of the systems. But that is really the. The crux of our, our RDA account and, and the $34 billion that is represented there. Transitioning to RDT and E, I already covered uh, the, the increase there of about $1.1 billion. That's very consistent with uh, the modernization plan and what we're trying to do there. And you can see uh, when, you, when you get into the details of the RDA, RDT and E budget, you can see in ST. About 80% is aligned against our modernization priorities. And then when you look at the remainder of the RDT and E accounts, about 60% of that is aligned to that. And um, so uh, the second half of that is procurement. And uh, in the procurement accounts, there's about $21.8 billion request there. You can see how that plays out. We've enjoyed some, uh, the Army has seen some increases in procurement over the last couple of years that very much informed where we were going to uh, request money uh, here in, in in 20 and so as as we are transitioning I would tell you this really represents uh, a balance more so than than what we've been able to do in the past uh, not only a balance that allows us to pursue the modernization strategy but really a balance that allows us to uh, have a, a greater balance between the in strength modernization and and current readiness So we, we can get into the details of some of the systems that, that we're looking at here. So uh, here in FY20, uh, there are increased funding levels for the Blackhawk, for the Striker Double V hull. Uh, we, we have pretty much maxed production on many of our, our missiles and munitions. ATACMs, Hellfires, Gimlers are, are all seeing a, a max production rate in this request. Um, we are continuing on the same glide path for Abrams upgrades and the Paladin. Uh, still uh, doing uh, the same amount of, of Apache remands uh, as we did here in FY19. The, the Secretary mentioned there's a couple of, of, of systems here that are going to start to see a decline in the funding levels, the Bradley, the JLTV, and the Amphi. And, um, and um, other than that, I would tell you this is probably... Um, a, a really good balanced uh, procurement program based upon everything we're trying to do uh, over time as you, as you look at this and you look at this across the continuum of the FIDEP. A couple of other accounts, we're asking for $300 million more million in MILCON. Uh, and you can see that that totals about 35 different projects. And then in our Army Family Housing, Army Family Housing is both construction and the operations of Army Family Housing. I am specifically talking about what the United States Army is responsible for uh, managing, what we own, okay? Uh, and so while uh, there's about a $500 million request here, some of that is to construct three new housing projects. Uh, and some of that, of course, is to operate and maintain the housing that we do have. Uh, we were also able this year to divest ourselves of some pricey leases, leases uh, overseas, so that, that helped us save some money in that, in that account as well. 
There's a couple of other base accounts in there. I don't need to cover those in great detail. Army Arlington National Cemetery, uh, the Kim D. Mill uh, accounts that we, we have at, at, at uh, Pueblo. And um, I just got a, a, a small little picture there on the OCO request. And so you can see there uh, it's 31.6. Again, funding those same those same operations as we as we've done in the past, and uh, a little over five billion of that are passed through accounts. So just to just to kind of wrap up here, 182.3 billion dollars is the Army's budget request. Uh, allows us to stay on the trajectory uh, to achieve our readiness goals. It is absolutely focused on the NDS, uh, modest in strength growth, and uh, in terms of readiness, of course. Um, you know, you heard about the one station unit training. We're able to invest in the home station unit training that makes the CTC rotation so much more valuable. And a very, got a very healthy reform agenda going on here as well. And of course, strengthening the partnerships. I uh, wanted to cover that uh, and, and do that kind of quickly so that we could afford you as much time as possible to ask some questions. Okay, sir. So, first, we're going to start with Lita and then we're going to hit Sydney next. So, Lita. Hi, Lita Baldor with AP. Um, I have a, I'm still a little bit confused on the Milcon um, issue. So I'm wondering if you can help explain. Um, in the DOD budget, they talk about um, 3.6 to 3.6 billion, right? 3.6 billion for new border wall funding and 3.6 billion to repay um, what will be spent this year if the emergency funding is used for out of Milcon. I'm wondering. Is this in the Army budget? Where is it in the Army budget? And is the 3.6 billion in its own separate fund for the border? Or is it in projects that you think you might have to take away from because of the emergency? I'm just confused on how that's going to work. So it is 3.6 and 3.6 and, and 2 billion, right? That adds up to 9.2. Three points, it's all in the military construction army OCO account okay and um, while they have uh, the, the the department has asked us to to leave the answers to these questions to them I can I can just sketch it out for you really quick 3.6 could be for uh, new construction uh, for emergency purposes three points new construction barrier or new construction uh, just emergency construction is how we call that okay Another okay. 3.6 would be uh, in the event that we would need to restore some funding in some of the MILCOM projects that funding was otherwise uh, redirected to a different purpose. And then $2 billion would be for hazard remediation but or hurricane remediation. Just for, to clarify, the $3.6 billion for new construction in Army OCO, does it, it's, is it new construction for the border or is it just one big pot of $3.6 billion that can be used for any emergency the Army deems appropriate. So uh, we call this emergency uh, for emergency purposes. So any any details, ma'am? I'm sorry, I'd ask you to talk to us. And then we'll, so. we'll get with you offline we to see if we can get more answers to the question. So we'll hit Sydney first. We'll go back to Ryan. Hi. Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, I'm not asking you to recite all 30 priority programs or all 93 cut programs in rhyming couplets, but you know, can you give us some prominent examples? I mean, I look through this budget, I see a small decrease in some of the AFE, mod new construction. Uh, no CH-47 mod still seems to be going strong. Now, I'm not seeing any big heads on the wall or any small things, things emerging that were negligible suddenly getting big. So, of all those, the three things that go up and the, the 186 things that go down, what are some prominent examples that were particularly you're particularly proud of, particularly were painful to to achieve but still necessary? Give us some highlights from that, sir. Um, so, Sydney, the uh, the choices of, of how these programs will be divested happen across the FIDIP towards the end of the FIDIP, and you're synchronizing them with the investment portfolios, next generation combat vehicle or future vertical lift. So when you've, you've kind of gotten through the, the prototyping experimentation phase and then you're, you're heading into a low rip, uh, L-rip, excuse me, low uh, rate initial production tranches of capability and then you'll, that looking like in a sand chart, you'll see them start to di divest the assets and bring the new ones on. So it's, it's, it's starting to signal as the funding lays in over time and you get through the modernization process, 
ultimately they synchronize towards the back end of this uh, FIDIP. So that 30 odd billion that's moving, we're not going to see very much much of it this year. Most of it's backloaded in the find up, which we don't have. Uh, it's another step. Because uh, you kind of look, the pipes start to open. The funding increases year over year as the maturity of systems come online. Okay, so let's go to Ryan. Hi, Brown, CNN. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit about some of the money that was used operations for the Southwest Border Mission. Obviously, that was an emerging requirement. Uh, but in, is there any money that's to replenish some of those O and M funds that were used to kind of pay for that this year? Or is there any projection that that operation will continue and how much money is allocated to that operation? So in the FY20 budget, there we are not requesting funds to conduct uh, missions on the southwest border. Uh, as you're well aware, we do have some soldiers down there right now performing missions in support of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but right now in the 20 budget, no, there, we don't have, uh, we're not requesting funds for that purpose. And can you say what fund is being used to support that current operation? Or so right now, the Army's using some of its O&M to, 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 to fund that. It's not staggering to the point where, you know, it, it's, it's hurting our readiness, but it, it could. Thank you. Hi, Marcus Westerberg with Defense One. Um, yesterday, the Pentagon said it was beginning, I believe it's called fabrication activities on uh, uh, non-INF compliant uh, cruise missile systems. Is any of that in the Army budget? Is that the ATACMS plus up that is uh, in there? Um, we are in the um, process of developing uh, the Precision Strike Missile, which is an ATACMS replacement program. Uh, it's, it's a greater lethality, a two in the tube, same platform essentially. Uh, what the industry has uh, indicated to us is that if indeed the United States were to uh, you know, depart from the INF Treaty, that it's a software updating of the development of that system and you could extend the range beyond. Uh, the INF limitations, uh, how, you know, the, to the extent it would go north of that number, but uh, we'd have to spiral in capability later to get even greater ranges. But the capability exists today. Okay. Kind of a quick follow-up. Uh, JLTV, I noticed, went down a little bit. Is there any changes to the program of record there, or what's to account for the decline? So uh, looking hard at the requirements associated, just how many JLTVs that we need in the program, uh, you know, our vehicle fleet today has, uh, I think, uh, I'd have to be correct, but between Humvee, JLTV, and Infantry Squad Vehicle, we have well north of 100,000 vehicles in our vehicle fleet. And so we're trying to hone in on the exact number of requirements of vehicles, and uh, it's, uh, that's why the buy will be truncated over time. Hi, Tara Kopp with Military Times. Um, if you compare the administration's FY19 request to the FY20 request for Army and strength total reserve and active. It looks like the growth is actually slowing. You were projected to be at an end strength of about 25,000 more than you will be in 2023. So I'm wondering if that is that just a reflection of maybe uh, either recruiting challenges or just this right sizing for what uh, the previous person said was, you know, our next fight won't be a desert, desert storm fight. Uh, no, we, we do need to grow. We need the growth. Uh, the issue there is uh, it's two variables associated with the decision. Uh, one is uh, financially, obviously, and then the second uh, from a standpoint of we wanted to make sure that we could have modest, steady growth, maintain quality uh, standards. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are uh, difficult challenges that are presented at 3.9 percent un uh, unemployment. Uh, we're, we're looking for We changed our strategy. Uh, in the Department of the Army, focusing on 22 key cities in the United States, um, looking at the changes within our Army uh, uh, marketing organization, how we message to the country. So we thought that a, a slower, more mod modest growth was effective, but we will still be on track uh, to pursue about a 488,000 in strength by the end of this fit-up. We're going to move inside the room, Jen, and then Ashley, and then in the middle. Jen. Hi, Jen Johnson with Defense News. I wanted to ask about some of the missile increases that we're seeing in the budget. Uh, it looks like Hellfire, you're planning to buy 5,112. Um, Gimler's also has an increase. Um, was that planned? You know, why the sudden increase in FY20, especially when you know you've cleared Jagum Hellfire's replacement uh, for production? Yeah. Um. The, the, a lot of this was the replenishment of existing stocks and get to that tamer 
uh, which is the you know the the worldwide requirement for uh, munitions. Uh, so I and we had the uh, we had the opportunity with uh, the 1819 budget deal to really get back to that. And I think we'll be restored we're by 21, yeah. 22. We're at max capacity. Right? We're, so we're at max capacity. It's about the middle of the fit up where we'll we'll hit uh, the the total requirement. So. Uh, um, we we're, you know, were very blessed with the 1819 deal, and it really got, helped us get back to restore the health of those stocks. But just to follow up, though, is was that plan, the Hellfire increase specifically, was that planned um, last year, or is this kind of a new decision that was made because you just still haven't met what you need to? Well, much of it was also, uh, you know, we had an, uh, an extensive utilization in the Middle East, uh, and uh, we're, the burn rates were pretty high, so we had to uh, make an adjustment to restore those stocks. Um, it came up in the, the last briefing, I think, that the DOD might make the FIDEP confidential or not show the, the FIDEP numbers. Does the Army plan to release its FIDEP in full? Um, we uh, use that. We usually call it for official use. We keep it sensitive. The numbers change a lot, uh, you know, so as you make adjustments. So that's usually why we don't publish them, because uh, we want to be consistent in how we communicate externally. Just since that was a short one, um, there was a major increase in RDT&E for BA4 under that line, um, also called Advanced Component Development and Prototypes. Um, what was the discussion or rationale behind that decision, and then what risk are you taking by cutting uh, the basic research s and Well, it's a very simple. We want to fly it before we buy it. We have to see, to learn from these uh, uh, experiments so that we can get the best solutions possible and, and you know if we're gonna fail early we're gonna do it early and cheap uh, so uh, um, a much more of a, an aggressive posture with prototyping these capabilities um, so I'm just looking now at the uh, RDT and E chart so I was just wondering um, the ranking out of the modernization modernization priorities long-range precision fires is on top but here in the chart says next-gen combat vehicle has almost 500 million more for RDT&E. Um, so I was just wondering, two uh, long-range precision fires just below 1 billion. So I was just wondering how that kind of fared out. Yeah, so just on sheer volume, you're correct. Uh, you know, the, you have to also keep, take into account the hardware costs associated with those priorities. Uh, we fill them in order. Uh, so if the requirement is X, you're going to get the money first. Uh, but um, with respect to like combat vehicle and helicopters, uh, the hardware and the software is just very expensive on those assets. Um, two questions. Uh, first, on the southwest border, um, the 3.6 and the 3.6, is that going through your what you call the pass through uh, accounts in your OCO, or is that a different thing? So uh, that is just right, right now placed in the Army's uh, OCO MILCON account. Um, and so I would ask you, sir, again, let's, de uh, let's defer these questions to OSD, who can provide you with a greater level of detail. Also on the OCO, um, earlier we were told that the amount of money that has been shifted into OCO this year for base purposes has been done in the past. Uh, is that your recollection as well for both of you that the amounts of money that are being shifted in there, what are, what are some of the things that have been shifted into your Army OCO that are, seem to be new? So uh, th there has been over the, I'd say the last five to six years, there have been wedges of OCO for base purposes, as I like to call it, not, not, not to the size that you see here, uh, but that really just depended upon um, how much headspace we had in, in, in the base top line and what the base requirements were. So there was a little bit of a delta there. Uh, and, and, you know, that was, that was agreed upon and, and honored by Congress for the most part when we submitted our budget. So to the Secretary, do you anticipate any congressional issues then uh, with the much larger OCO uh, accounts this time around? I, I'm, I think we'll have substantial discussion when we, when we testify. Okay, I want to try to get some more questions out. So we're going to go into the center of the floor. We're going to go to you next. Uh, hi, Jack Detch from Al Monitor. Uh, I was curious about the Iron Dome interim purchase. I didn't see anything about it in the budget documents that you released today. So. Uh, are you still on track for September 2020 with that requirement? Uh, what's the cost going to look like? And then specifically, since that system's designed for rockets, artillery, that kind of thing, how is it going to work to defend against cruise missiles in the interim? Um, 
we uh, so I'll just do this. We are on track for the procurement. What I would ask you to do is we'll get you the, the experts to talk you through the mechanics of that. Okay. Hi. Um, so first, I wanted to follow up on Louis' question. Um, so I noticed in here this OCO says that it does not include the 9.2 billion in emergency funding. So can you just explain, um, just clarify for me where exactly does all of that 9.2 billion for the emergency funding is that all coming out of the Army's budget, and where is it exactly? So just to clarify, the Army's budget for budget for the Army is 182.3. Uh, in addition to that, there has been a $9.2 billion wedge placed in there by OSD uh, for emergency purposes. And uh, when, when we talk, when we lay our budget out and we talk to everybody about this to ensure consistency uh, from year to year, uh, I, you, we, we articulate it that way. So right now, our OCO request, not including the $9 billion, is uh, 31, 31.6, okay? So I would tell you that 9.2 needs to be discussed independent. Uh, right now it's just incorporated into the Army's budget so that OSD can, can, uh, to, can carry it forward to Congress as part of the, the defense request. It's not actually coming from the Army's budget. It, 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 it is right now placed for defense emergency purposes in the Army's budget, but it's the Department of Defense who needs to uh, represent that requirement. Okay. And then, sorry, also just a follow-up to Ashley's question on um, the FIDIP being classified. The FIDIP has not been classified in previous years. Um, so I, I don't believe that it is. They believe it's official. It's official use. Uh, it's for we, uh, so we're it's a uh, sensitive but not classified. But it's usually up um, on the comptroller's website, like for public release. Yeah, the, the PNR forms mm -hmm. show, show yeah. the OSD follow up. Yeah. So I want to do one more question just to, to wrap it up. Um, I know Mandy had one. Question. Hi, Amanda from CNBC. I understand that you're doing some balance sheet management and reinvesting across your priorities, but I'm wondering, are you expecting industry to um, articulate any concerns as you? sort of move away from some of these legacy platforms? Um, so we have, uh, you know, we've tried to do everything imaginable to signal our intent and where we're going. But the 18 and 19, uh, excuse me, the FY18 uh, ATR, we moved $994 million against our, our six signature priorities, the 30 weapon systems underneath those six priorities. Uh, we published a modernization strategy that we gave to Congress and to industry uh, every Monday night, we have a CEO dinner. Uh, we are consistently telegraphing to commercial industry where we're going. Now, that is not to say that there will not be uh, challenges associated with this. There are some transition points uh, in the out years where uh, we were going to be departing from legacy systems. But there'll be others that, uh, you know, on the front end of this process that may be affected. We're working with them. We're trying to communicate as transparently as possible. But we're going to do what we must to finance this, uh, uh, this ambition. Okay, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna need to wrap it up on want some closing remarks, either you or General Horland or sir. Uh, go ahead, you wanna go first? Uh, no, just thanks everybody, uh, appreciate that. I know there'll be follow-on questions and, and we'll, we'll accommodate you and do our best to answer all your questions in a timely manner, sir. Yeah, we're gonna make ourselves uh, available with the C, as much of you and as many of you as possible who's interested. Uh, it's a long process. Um, but we're making a lot of challenging decisions to finance our ambition, no matter if the Budget Control Act or other issues were to arise in the out years. We, we recognize that the fiscal climate, we could face uh, flat or declining budgets, and we're trying to make the decisions that were necessary um, to make these a uh, transformation of the Army in the out years. So i um, very grateful for the time, and I'm sure we'll see all of you here very soon. Thank you. Questions between myself, Wayne Hall, and Lieutenant Colonel Beth Smith. I know we got some follow ups and wrote down some notes that we owe you. Uh, we just want to make sure we got a transition time between the next service that's got to get up and brief, but we'll hang back, us three, to do some follow ups with you, okay? Thank you, everybody.